Now, the Ghanaian forces says uh, members of the Operation Gongo team working to restore calm around the Boko area this week neutralized some six persons who were fomenting trouble in the area. This is coming days after a member of parliament for Boko, Mahama Ayariga, revealed that eight civilians were allegedly murdered by persons believed to be from the military. According to the Ghana forces, their men were engaged in a shootout with hooded gunmen after receiving information of an attack on a bus on the Boko Highway. The statement by the Ghana Armed Forces reads, now, it says, uh, the attention of the Ghana Armed Forces has been drawn to the allegations by some individuals in Boko that soldiers deployed on Operation Gong Gong to restore calm in the area are killing innocent Kusasi youth and women in their homes and communities. They also allege that the military personnel have seized Zogging, a Kusasi community. Now, Garf wishes to categorically state that these allegations are false and unfounded. The statement again says, information received from the National Investigations Bureau by the Operation Gongo team of GAF, that's the Ghana Armed Forces, early this week indicates that passengers on board a yellow Kia Grand Bird bus which, with registration number AS3672-21 traveling from Accra to Mesiga were attacked by unknown gunmen around Welga on the Boko Highways. The gunmen fired through the tire and the engine compartment of the vehicle. The bus is currently parked at Asylum Down, Boko Divisional Police Station, for investigation to be conducted. Also, one Kia Rhino truck with registration number AS1793-17 was hit, and the driver of the truck, Al Hassan Abdullah, aged 40, from the Gonja tribe, sustained a gunshot wound on the left foot. He is currently receiving treatment at the Boko Presbyterian Hospital. Again on Wednesday, 1st February 2023, gunshots were heard around South Natinga in Boko. A patrol team rushed to the general area of the shooting where a suspect, Abdul Malik Haruna, aged 35 from the Mampusi tribe, was arrested. He was since he has since been handed over to the Boko police for further investigation. Now, it must also be placed on record that based on a tip-off by the Boko police on the hideout of the suspect alleged to be involved in a firing incident at Boko, troops conducted coding and search operations together with Boko police at Pateleme general area. Three suspects, Fatau Al-Hassan Binda, aged 42, Abubakar Idrisu, aged 44, and Al-Hassan Mustafa Binda, aged 33, all from the Dagomba tribe, were arrested in a house at Pateleme. They were handed over to the Boko police for further investigations. Now, in a separate incident, sporadic firing was heard around Sabongari, general area. A patrol team dispatched to assess the situation spotted unknown armed men at Guazesi Valley side in Sabongari wearing black t-shirt with black hoodies. Troops engaged them and neutralized six armed men. During the engagement, some armed men took cover in a madhouse within the immediate vicinity to engage the team. One of the men, uh, that's the armed men, attempted to attack troops with a cutlass but was disarmed in the process. During the operation, a local woman found with a gunshot injury on left hand was sent to Boko Presbyterian Hospital by troops for treatment. Now, the Upper East Regional Minister Stephen Jacobo believes the new strategies agreed on by the Regional Security Council will return calm to the area. RESEC meetings are <clears throat> meetings that we meet regularly to review the security situation in the region and to take uh, decisions uh, as to how we can keep uh, the region safe. So it's one of those uh, meetings. But um, Boko issue came in uh, because you know our hotspot now is uh, the jihadis in the region, no, the jihadis across the border and also uh, the Boko. Problems. So those are the things that we discuss. Of course, there are security matters, and I can't tell you what we discussed. Well, it's very sad um, that uh, people have lost their lives. Uh, it's something that RESEC we want to know what really happened. Uh, we are going. To, I also want to say that uh, 
this trouble Simbabwe is taking too long. We have been doing our best to make sure that there is peace in Mokou. Uh, the Interior Minister, uh, the uh, Minister for uh, Defence, uh, CDS, and all the big people, uh, IGP, they're all here uh, for us to see if we can put a peace. And I think it lasted for a bit, and then it started all over again. If you sit down and you think about it, you really don't know the reason why it is getting this way. And I think that probably there are also criminality in it, There's politics in it, criminality in it. People have their own reasons why uh, they probably don't want this to end. So I want to appeal through this medium that, look, let's give peace a chance. Our original correspondent, Albert Sorry, joins us with the latest on the ground. Albert, what more do we know about this, uh, you know, uh, volatile situation in Boko? Yes, so Cam has returned to Boko mm. today. Um, at the moment, we do not have reports of any incidents whatsoever. Um, yesterday, when this incident first happened, the youth of the area where um, the people were killed were very agitated and the fears at the time were that they could try to uh, take the law into their own hands because of how angry they were. But uh, following the, you know, the engagements with the security agencies and the traditional authority, uh, which led to the bodies of the uh, people who were killed being released for burial, uh, things have calmed down uh, a little bit since then. Um, because also we have heard from the military on this matter and the fact that now government uh, is showing signs that they are actually responding to these reports of military people allegedly attacking civilians, mm. it has uh, helped to also calm down nerves a little bit. Okay. Um, we know that the uh, RECSEG had, had been meeting and met, met today. After the meeting, what has that meeting brought on to the community? Yes, so what RECSEG is telling us is that they are going to commence investigation into the matter. One, because the people of the area uh, were pointing accusing fingers at the military. Now we have heard the side of the uh, story from the military as well. So Regional Security Council as um, the, the, the regional security uh, body will now have to serve as a neutral party in all of this and go into the area to investigate, to ascertain exactly how uh, these, kill <clears throat> Sorry, these killings actually happened yesterday. So... Uh, that, that is the situation that we okay. have, and because of that, we haven't seen any um, attacks, any reprisals whatsoever. Uh, what the regional minister says is that uh, from tomorrow, they will communicate with the people of the area before moving to the ground to commence investigations. But they've issued a statement also this evening in yeah. which they have sent out their condolences to the bereaved families and actually admonished the people not to try to um, engage the military because according to the regional security council it will be suicidal for civilians to try and um if you like engage the military in, okay. in the combat okay and so they are asking the, mm. the, the citizens to desist from attempting such a move okay Gr grateful so that's our correspondent albert sorry uh, so why is boko that volatile Dr. Victor Doke of the Kofi Annan Peacekeeping Training Center has conducted research on the volatile situation of Boko and joins us via Zoom. Now, Doc, I'm grateful that you could join us. What account for Boko being such a volatile area? Um, there are a lot of factors that uh, account to the region being volatile. One being the fact that um, the party, Mount Pussy Party Pair Field Findings, have to go through legal processes before they can celebrate their festival. Now, for them, they view that as revering the authority of the Bokunaba. 
which they don't want to. The other factor is the unresolved farmland issues. During the conflict, the armed violence, farmlands were taken away from Mount where most of them are farmers. Now, this issue is still lingering on. It's an outstanding issue that authorities and stakeholders have to look at. People are aggrieved. They cannot farm. And so, therefore, once they cannot farm, there's no livelihood. And it all amounts to the region being volatile. The other aspect is looking at the Okro stick ceremony. This rite is supposed to be performed to declare the conflict over. Till date, it has not been performed. The Mapusis state categorically it is not part of their culture. They don't see it as a reason to celebrate. Now, the other aspect is looking at paying homage to the Bokunaba, which the Mapusis would not like to uh, um, adhere to. Mm. Mm. The important aspect is the proliferation of weapons in Boko. The question is, how did these youths get these weapons? So weapons that our state security even don't have, these youths have it. Now, you have youths who farm or go into business, get their returns, and then buy or purchase weapons with the notion of self-defense and protecting my property, my family, because I don't trust the state security to be able to protect my family. Now, currently, there's a, a ban on farming with relation to the mampuses. So now, people cannot have their livelihoods. All these factors mentioned contribute to the region being volatile because people are aggrieved. Mm. So, so what did your research recommend as the way forward to a lasting peace in that area? First off, the... Local representation, the Boko Inter-Ethnic Peace Committee, needs to be resourced financially. They have to go through te technical training. And then they have to be trained on conflict resolution matters to handle and resolve the farmland issues. There has to be a negotiation or an idea and opinion to come up with new ways to celebrate or to perform the Boko Stick Ceremony to declare the conflict over. Now, how do we get the weapons out of the system? Some time ago, the government came up with a cash for weapon, which was not successful. They need to relook really at all these systems and bring up new modalities. Now, the other aspect is to look at how people can have their livelihoods back. If there is an option to celebrate the acoustic festival, then people can now go to their farms and then engage. The CSOs have to come on board. I know OneF is doing a lot. Buda is also contributing its quota as the peace building facilitator. The early warning systems in the region have to be re-looked at. OneF has instituted what they call the community monitoring team. If they can, they have to re-look at the membership and how they collect the data and information and process. Mm. Grateful to you, Dr. Doke, for uh, spending time with us.